If there is one thing that marks off the moral philosophy of the last 30 years or so from earlier moral philosophy, I think it's probably the concern of moral philosophers with language, with how moral utterances differ from non-moral ones in their use. Previously, it had been assumed that to call something good was at least to describe it. G. E. Moore, for instance, started from that assumption and went on to ask whether goodness was a natural or a non-natural quality. Then, in 1944, was published a book called Ethics and Language by C. L. Stevenson. And we came to see that besides a descriptive use of language, there can be an emotive one. Language can be used to express one's feelings and to persuade others to feel likewise. The trouble about emotivism, as it was called, was that it became rather hard to see the place of reason in ethics. Certainly, you can't recognize something as good without feeling drawn to it in some way, but isn't there more to it than that? Can't people argue about what is good, about what ought to be done? Isn't there such a thing as moral reasoning? It was against this background of thought about the nature of morality that Richard Hare, White's Professor of Moral Philosophy in the University of Oxford, wrote two books, The Language of Morals and Freedom and Reason. In this program, he discusses his moral philosophy with Anthony Kenny, Fellow of Balliol College, Oxford. Professor Hare, before we start our discussion, I wonder if you could give the students um, a statement of your basic position. You mentioned in a preface of a recent book that you were first interested in moral philosophy because of an interest in actual moral problems. What was it that started you off? Well, I suppose it happened just before and during the Second World War. In the 30s, there was a lot of unemployment, a lot of poverty, much worse than anything's happening here now. and it raised problems about inequalities of wealth, for example, and then there was the problem of war itself, whether it is ever right to fight. And of course, behind these there loomed bigger problems about what one's purpose ought to be in life anyway. These were moral problems, all boiling down to questions of what one ought to do, and they were pressing because one had to decide what to do. For example, whether to join the army when Hitler started his war. I never thought of moral problems as anything else but extremely practical ones. Perhaps that's why I became a prescriptivist. I only became clear about how philosophy could help after the war, though I was thinking a lot about philosophy during it. It became clear to me that the first step in tackling any difficult question is to understand what it is you're asking. And this involves knowing the meaning of the words in the question. I came to this conclusion partly, I suppose, as a result of reading what Plato said about Socrates, who started the business, and partly as a result of contact with the new school of analytical philosophy. I thought that if one was to answer questions about what one ought to do, one had to know what ought meant, and I realized that I didn't begin to know what it meant, and to try to find out what it meant was doing moral philosophy. Another reason why we have to find out what such words mean is that only then shall we be clear about their logical properties. And we won't be able to tell whether arguments about what we ought to do are good arguments or bad arguments until we know what the logical properties of the words are. For only in that way can we tell what follows from what, what propositions are consistent with one another, and so on. So philosophical analysis really is indispensable if we're going to get to the bottom of any difficult problem in morality. Though I don't say that it's the only thing we have to do, because usually there are very difficult factual questions involved too, about the consequences of the alternative actions. I'll try and show you what I mean by taking the word ought, because it's perhaps the simplest of these words. What I think I've discovered is that this, I don't think I was the first person to discover it, but uh, what I think I've discovered is that this word has two properties which together determine its meaning. First of all, it's not emotive, that'd be quite wrong, but prescriptive. This means 
that for any ought statement, there's something that counts as acting in accordance with it. And that if you don't so act, when the occasion arises, you can't be really and sincerely subscribing to it, unless, of course, you're unable to act as it requires. The second logical property that ought statements have is what's been called their universalizability. I apologize for these long words. By this I mean that if I say that someone ought to do something, it has to be because of something about him and his situation. And that if this something were to be true of any other person in any other situation, I couldn't without inconsistency deny that the person in that other situation ought to do the same. In fact, moral judgments rest on principles, perhaps complex principles, applying to all situations of a certain kind. And it's these principles that we are really subscribing to when we make moral judgments. Now, in my first book, The Language of Morals, I was trying to establish that moral judgments have these two properties. And in my second book, Freedom and Reason, I was trying to show how a theory of moral reasoning can be founded on these properties. Well, both these books have been extremely influential. I think that in this country and abroad, uh, people have looked at many questions in moral philosophy quite differently as a result of reading these books. But I'd like to focus, if I may, on some of the criticisms that have been made of your position. I don't think that people really want to contest, not in this country at any rate, that moral judgments are universalizable. Uh, and I, for my own part, wouldn't want to contest that they are prescriptive if all that that means is that they have consequences for action. But I am rather doubtful whether these two characteristics that you pick on of being prescriptive and being universalizable are sufficient uh, to characterize what is special about morality and moral judgments. Can I just go over the distinction uh, which you make between is statements and ought statements to see that I've got it right? Uh, you have, first of all, is statements which are descriptive, they describe things, they say what the world is like, and they're universalizable. Uh, if I describe this piece of paper as white, I have to describe anything which is, resembles it in the relevant respects as white. At the other extreme, you have imperatives, commands. These are prescriptive, uh, that is, they tell us what to do, but they're non-universalizable. Uh, if I ask you to pass the butter, uh, this is prescriptive, it tells you something to do, but it isn't universalizable. I don't mean that everybody situated as you are has to pass the butter. In between these, we have ought statements, and they share with imperatives the characteristic of being prescriptive, telling us what to do, but they share with is statements the property of being universalizable. Is that fair as a statement of your position? Well, I think I'd accept it as a summary statement of my position. Of course, one has to oversimplify. Naturally. Now, the question that I want to put to you is whether this is really an adequate characterization of moral judgments. I mean, suppose that a society had a, a set of precepts, say that they were dietary precepts. Um, one was not to eat beans, say, or one was not to eat cabbage. Suppose that these were regarded as uh, prescriptive judgments. Obviously, there are uh, conclusions to be drawn about action, not to eat beans, not to eat cabbage. And these are universalizable. These people believe very firmly uh, that human beings, all human beings, should refrain from eating beans or eating cabbage. Now, it seems to me that if this is all we are told about the people in this society, uh, we can't yet say that this is a moral system that they have. Well, I think I should like to say to that that I don't attach enormous importance to the word moral. What I attach importance to is having a set of principles to live by. Now, I don't care frightfully whether you call them moral or not, but if these bean eaters that you describe um, really stuck to eating beans through thick and thin and uh, let that principle override all sorts of principles we call moral principles, uh, in the same way as that in which some people even nowadays do to certain sexual taboos, uh, then I think we would call them, I would call them moral principles, just like people call these sexual principles moral principles.
Well, the people that I had in mind were really people who wouldn't eat beans. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, <laughs> I, I chose negative principles uh, deliberately, but never mind uh, that. Uh, the, uh, you, you said if, they, if these people allowed the, um, the eating of beans or the non-eating of beans to override things which we would call moral principles, uh, then we might say that they had a moral system too. Uh, I think I agree with that, but it seems to me that now the crucial point is what are the reasons why we call the things that we do call moral principles? And I put it to you that it is that uh, there must be something else besides being prescriptive and universalizable which makes us call the things we call moral principles by that name. Uh, Excuse me, I don't mm -hmm. think that's really the question at all. I think the question is not why we call them moral principles, but why we accept those moral principles and don't accept the moral principle about not eating beans. But you would They're both moral mm -hmm. principles, and I think an explanation would be given of why we or why I uh, mm -hmm. don't include the thing about not eating beans in my set of moral principles, if that's what you'd like. But if anybody did, I would say that he held a very extraordinary moral principle. It would be enough to make it a moral principle merely that he held it in this way. It would be enough to make it his moral principle. I would say of him that he was holding it as a moral principle. If he really mm. stuck to it like that, yes. Like people stick to... I mean, uh, take the, the rules against incest, for example. Uh, I think I can imagine a culture which regarded uh, the rule against incest in much the light in which you evidently regard the rule against eating beans. And uh, uh, a two people in that culture could be having the same discussion as we're now having uh, with the examples turned round. And you would be saying to me, suppose somebody thought it frightfully wrong to, uh, say, go to bed with his sister. Uh, could you really call that a moral principle? Well, you don't think that there has to be any, anything about the content uh, of um, a judgment in order to make it a moral judgment? Not so in order it doesn't to have it to have any connection with human welfare or happiness or anything like that? Uh, not in order to make it a moral judgment. Uh, of course, once one has accepted the formal properties, which I say moral judgments have, namely prescriptivity and universalizability, I think I can give you very good reasons why we all accept the uh, moral principles we do, which nearly all of them have something to do with human happiness. But I refrain from writing this into the definition of the word moral simply because I do wish to be able to argue with people, and one does meet people who don't um, think of uh, human happiness as of prime importance. Uh, Nietzscheans, for example. Uh, I want to be able to have an argument with them. I want to start far enough back, as it were, in order to catch them into the argument so that I can use the purely formal properties of the words in order to reason with them. If we rule them out at the beginning, as not just just not having uh, moral opinions at all. The argument could never begin. They would go on with their opinions, we would have ours, and we couldn't reason with them. If you restrict yourself uh, to the purely formal properties in that way, then it isn't at all clear what reason anybody has for adopting morality at all, that is, for, for talking the type of language which is characterized by the formal properties you mention. If morality is closely connected with human happiness, then one can see why somebody, either through prudential reasons or benevolent reasons, would have an interest in talking about morality. But if morality need not as such have any connection with happiness, why should anyone trouble about moral language? Well, the beauty of it is that when the moral words are defined in terms of their formal properties, uh, although we haven't written anything about human happiness into their definition, nevertheless, we can see extremely good reasons why people should want to have a set of words in their language having those properties, simply because if you are trying with the other people in your society to come to a set of principles expressed, say, in terms of the word ought, uh, with those formal properties, which you can all accept. That to say, if I may repeat, if you're trying to find um, a set of kinds of behavior that all of you can prescribe universally for the behavior of all of you, whether or not, of course, um, uh, uh, well, you don't start, that's to say, with any uh, content into the 
uh, which is going to be written in, in, into your definition of morality. But if you just start off with those formal principles, it's obvious, I think, why people will be likely to accept a set of such universal principles for the behavior of all of them, which will be directed towards the um, increase in human happiness. Isn't this obvious? Uh, I think that it's obvious that they will be uh, keen to um, increase human happiness. Uh, whether they will think that this is uh, best done by adopting a particular style of the use of language is, I think, rather a different matter. But perhaps I could uh, connect with this something that seems to me to have been a development in your own interest over the years. Um, you in the language of morals, you were interested mainly, I think, in an ethical problem, a problem about the nature of moral judgment, a philosophical problem, uh, about the distinction between moral judgments and other sorts of judgment. Um, you described yourself as a prescriptivist, and you named your opponents descriptivists, descriptivists being the people who thought that moral judgments were in some way judgments about the world, judgments that told us how the world was. And you, as a prescriptivist, uh, said that no, when one is making a moral judgment, one is essentially prescribing for oneself and for others. Now, that's um, a moral, uh, an ethical distinction, a distinction about the nature of moral language. There is another moral distinction which can be contrasted with this. That is the distinction between absolutist moralities and consequentialist moralities. Let me explain what I mean. An absolutist is somebody who thinks that there are certain types of action which should never be done, no matter what the consequences. He may say, for instance, uh, nobody should ever be judicially tortured, no matter what would be the consequences of not torturing him. Uh, somebody else, a consequentialist, might say, we can't decide in advance whether torture is right or wrong. Uh, in any particular case, we must try to assess the consequences of torturing somebody or of not torturing him. The classical utilitarians, I think Bentham and Mill, were consequentialists in this way. Now, one can combine uh, these two distinctions in various ways. You can be a prescriptivist absolutist, or you can be a prescriptivist consequentialist, and you can combine consequentialism with prescriptivism or with descriptivism. Uh, you yourself, uh, if I understand rightly, are a prescriptivist consequentialist. Well, I'll be able to say that when I understand your distinction better. Uh, I incline to think that in most senses of absolutist, at any rate, I'm an absolutist. For example, I'm not a relativist, but that I think is not the distinction you're making. Uh, I don't really see why a person who assigns importance to the consequences of actions, what you're doing when you're doing something, can't be called an absolutist in any sense I would understand. I mean, a person, for example, who thinks that one absolutely ought not to bring about pain in somebody else by torture. Now, isn't that uh, a consequence that uh, one's forbidden to bring about? Well, one can be absolutist about some things and not others. Certainly, one might be um, uh, an absolutist about torture and say that uh, torture is absolutely wrong, meaning by this, that once any action falls under the description torture, you don't need to know anything more about it in order to know that it's wrong. And the same person might not be, say, an absolutist about lying. He might think some lies were all right, some lies were not, and one ought to know more about them. I'd like to, to ask you, uh, as not now as a moral philosopher, but as a moralist, whether you are, in fact, absolutist about torture, whether you think torture is always and absolutely wrong. Well, uh, not. Uh, it's hard to answer that question uh, until you tell me what I'm allowed to include under always. Uh, now, I can imagine, I can think up situations, mm -hmm. entirely fantastic ones, if you like, in which I would think it right to torture somebody in order to extract information for him. I give an example of this in one of my books. But uh, I don't think that such situations are likely to occur. Even if they do occur, really, uh, I think that uh, once the uh, people who are in charge of these things, say, um, members of the police force, uh, 
get it into their heads that it is sometimes legitimate to torture prisoners, they will so easily persuade themselves that the particular case which confronts them is one of these cases. And so, therefore, it is very much best if uh, they simply rule it out from their minds. The point here is I'm not against these um, rather simple principles, which I think is what the absolutist is really after. Uh, I'm not against them. The quarrel is one about their status. But doesn't this mean that you think that the philosopher should really deceive the policeman? Uh, you, as a philosopher, uh, having studied the hypothetical cases, can see that torture isn't always wrong, but you think it would be a good thing if the policeman believed it was always wrong. Well, here I'm importing the um, question of belief onto. I mean, I don't uh, like to talk in those terms, but I think it would be a good thing if the policeman, or I, if I were a policeman, even if I did philosophy sometimes uh, at other, uh, when I wasn't being a policeman, I would still think it right for me as a policeman to put the idea of torturing prisoners out of my head. And this is a perfectly consistent position for a philosopher to hold. Uh, as a philosopher, I can say, well, there might be fantastic situations in which it would be right to torture people, but once I get into my constable's uniform, whatever policemen wear, uh, I must just put it out of my head, because although it's conceivable that such cases might occur, they're very unlikely to occur, and if I once let myself think they might occur, and that this case might be one of them, then I shall find myself doing it. I'm interested that you didn't like uh, talking about believing that torture was always wrong. Uh, I take it that when you express um, what I would call a moral belief, uh, what I can get from this, on your view, is not any information about the world, but only information about you. If you tell me that torture is always wrong, then all I can really learn from this is a certain resolution that you have taken rather than anything about the world. Well, as in, in the same sense um, that uh, if you uh, tell me that the train left five minutes ago, all you can get from watching me say that, or listening to me say that, is an information about what I believe about the train. No, because if I think that your belief has been correctly arrived at, and knowing you to be the kind of person you are, I would assume it had been, I can get the further information that the train leaves at that time. Well, then, let's be quite clear about this. There are two things, at least at any rate, two things that happen uh, when I tell you the thing about the train. One is, uh, you, from my behaviour, gather that I believe something, and that's a piece of information. You also, if I'm uh, an honest man and well-informed, gather some information about the train. Now, if I tell you that I think that torturing is always wrong, uh, you get, parallel to the first of those, um, some information about what I think about torturing. The second thing that happens, however, is different. What I have conveyed to you, and what, if you agree with me, you will think, will be that torturing is wrong, which is something prescriptive. But I don't get any information about um any objective moral values. And I think that this yeah. is what some of your critics have had in mind when they say that your view annihilates moral values. You've denied that you do this, but it seems to me that you, you do annihilate moral values in the same sense as somebody annihilates Santa Claus when he tells a child that Santa Claus doesn't, doesn't exist. Of course, it would be an awful pity to annihilate Santa Claus if Santa Claus was doing any good. But if um, either he didn't exist, or he wasn't doing any good, or if the belief in him might have been doing positive harm, uh, then it wouldn't be a bad thing that people should learn that he doesn't exist and learn to get on without him. Thank you very much, Professor Hurt.